and welcome to Relevant History. I'm Dan Toller. I want to begin this episode with an apology. Last episode, I talked about the Iroquois Confederacy, properly known as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Well, somewhere around the halfway mark, I had a brain fart and started saying Haudenosaunee, and somehow missed that in two rounds of editing. It's Haudenosaunee. As far as I know, the word Haudenosaunee only exists inside my brain. Anyway, moving on. This episode is going to be a mirror image of last week's. And by that, I mean that it's a similar story of colonization and conquest. And it's happening at the same time for many of the same reasons, but it's happening on the opposite side of the globe. Even as Western Europeans begin to settle in North America and eventually settle westward into the interior, Russian settlers are advancing into their own frontier. And in a show about nationalism and national identity, this is incredibly important. It always weirds me out a little bit that the U.S. and Russia are constantly at odds in modern times, because the two countries actually have a lot in common. Both are frontier nations who grew into their role as a world power by spreading across a continent. Russia's story begins with the unification of Far Eastern Europe by Ivan IV, and we'll get to that in a second. But Russia doesn't truly become Russia in the modern sense until Ivan's men cross the Ural Mountains into Asia and conquer the Siber Khanate. It's at this moment that Russia becomes a multi-continental empire, and the frontier is open all the way to the Pacific. And that's what I want to talk about today. Siberia has a lot in common with North America in this time period, in the late 1500s. We talked last week about how the North American peoples had different cultures and different linguistic groups, and Siberia also has many cultures and languages. In the late 1500s, the most numerous peoples are Turkic and Mongol people, but there are also Central Asians called the Tungusic peoples, who are a diverse group in and of themselves, and they live as far east as the Pacific and even share a lot of genetic markers with Native Americans. And there are also Uralic peoples in the north. These are an indigenous northern group, and Interestingly enough, Hungarian is part of this language family as well, and as we know, the Hungarians' ancestors came out of Asia, and this similarity gives us a clue as to where. In far northeastern Siberia, there are some Eskimo peoples whose languages are very similar to the ones spoken by indigenous peoples in Alaska and northern Canada. And then there are the Kamchatkan peoples on the Kamchatkan Peninsula, and the Ainu, who are spread through much of the eastern area as well. Point being, it is a very diverse place. And these people don't just have different cultures. They have different religions and traditions and technologies. And like the indigenous peoples of North America, they have no written records prior to European contact. The only things we know about them before the late 1500s come from times where they bumped into the Chinese, which did happen. But for the most part, to the Chinese, just as to the Europeans, these people were off the edge of the map. Well, not quite, because the Chinese are next door to the Mongols, but they don't seem to have much interest in any of the rest of these people beyond the frontier. Point being, until the Russians go into Siberia, it's tough to get a picture of the region's earlier history. But before we get carried away with similarities between Russia and the U.S., let's be clear. Siberia is much, much bigger, and it's much more sparsely populated. Siberia has a land area of just over 5 million square miles. To put that in perspective, the United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, and overseas territories, has a land area of just under 3.8 million square miles. 
So you could put the entire U.S. into Siberia and still have 1.2 million square miles left over. To put that number in perspective, the entire European Union has a land area of a little over 1.6 million square miles. So if you put the EU and the U.S. together, it's only slightly larger than Siberia. And before the 1500s, this is all frontier. Besides being much larger than the U.S., Siberia has far less population. If you remember from last episode, North America in this time period has millions of indigenous peoples living in it. By comparison, Siberia has a population of around 250,000, although that's a rough estimate. In the late 1500s, that's less than the population of the city of Paris. Most of these tribes are so isolated that they've never even encountered diseases like smallpox, which most of Afro-Eurasia is already familiar with. That's something they share in common with the indigenous peoples of North America, and if you think I'm foreshadowing here, you are correct. So, why are there so few people in Siberia? If your first instinct is to say that Siberia is cold, well, you're partially right. The northern third or so of the region is permafrost. The ground is literally frozen year-round, and if the top few inches do thaw in the summer, it's poor soil, and it's no good for farming, and, well, reindeer herding is a hard life. But further south of that permafrost is the Siberian taiga. This is the world's largest forest by land area, and it's all hills and rivers and pine trees as far as the eye can see. It's a beautiful landscape, but the acidity from the pine needles keeps most other plants from growing, so not only is it bad farming land, but it's bad grazing land, too. And wherever there aren't trees in this area, you run into swamps and other obstacles. Now, there is a little band of deciduous forest south of the taiga that could be cleared for farming, but no agricultural peoples have moved there. That's probably because that area is adjacent to the Great Eurasian Steppe, which stretches roughly from Hungary to Mongolia. The steppe is excellent grazing land, so it's where you see all of the horse archer peoples in history coming out of. And because these people tend to raid the settled societies around them, it makes sense that nobody's trying to farm in this little band of forest in southern Siberia. So, this begs the question, doesn't it? Why would the Russians want to go there in the first place? As it turns out, they do it for the same reason early European settlers settled the northeast part of North America. They do it for furs. This huge wilderness is rich with valuable furs. And as soon as someone is powerful enough to establish a trade network, they're going to be able to take advantage. Now, the first people in Russia who we know about for sure are the Kievan Rus. These are a Scandinavian people, Vikings, if you will, who found the village of Staraya Ladoga around the year 750 in what is now far northwest Russia, not far from the border with modern-day Finland. These Vikings are initially attracted by trade, since they have encountered traders with Islamic silver coins in this area. Over the next century, these Scandinavian peoples work their way south, trading with the locals, enslaving them, and discovering a river network they can use to get from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south. Here, they encounter Greek traders and a market for their goods. These early Russian people are a mix of Scandinavian aristocracy, and by a couple of hundred years later, there is a majority Slavic peasant population. Both because of their Viking longboats and their propensity for using rowboats to navigate long rivers, 
they become known as the Rus, literally meaning the men who row. Eventually, these Scandinavian-ruled lands in Eastern Europe become divided between three brothers, but two of them would die, and around the year 862, Rurik, the oldest brother, becomes ruler of all the lands in what is now northwest Russia, which is centered around the trading city of Novgorod. Sometime in the 860s, Rurik grants permission for a naval raid on Byzantium, which the Rus call Tsargrad, literally Emperor City. <laughs> exactly how severe this raid is is unclear, but it unsettles the emperor enough that he dispatches missionaries north to try and convert the Rus to Christianity. When Rurik dies in 879, his successor Oleg begins conquering his way southward, pushing out the nomadic horse peoples in the area. In 882, he reaches Kiev in modern-day Ukraine. At the time, Kiev is a small, walled trading town ruled by two renegade Rus named Askold and Deer. The Russian Primary Chronicle is a written history of this time, compiled by Kievan monks in the 13th century. In it, we read a description of how Oleg takes the town, and we read how Oleg uses Rurik's younger son, Igor, to enhance his own authority. And just as a note, when this text calls the Rus Varangians, it's using the contemporary Greek term for Scandinavians. Here's what the Chronicle says about Oleg's conquests. Quote, He then came to the hills of Kiev and saw how Askold and Deer reigned there. He hid his warriors in the boats, left some others behind, and went forward himself bearing the child Igor. He thus came to the foot of the Hungarian hill, and after concealing his troops, he sent messengers to Askold and Deer, representing himself as a stranger on his way to Greece on an errand for Oleg and for Igor, the prince's son, and requesting that they should come forth to greet them as members of their race. Askold and Deer straightway came forth. Then all the soldiery jumped out of the boats, and Oleg said to Askold and Deer, You are not princes, nor even of princely stock, but I am of princely birth. Igor was then brought forward, and Oleg announced that he was the son of Rurik. They killed Askold and Deer, and after carrying them to the hill, they buried them there, on the hill now known as Hungarian, where the castle of Olma now stands. Over that tomb, Olma built a church dedicated to St. Nicholas, but Deer's tomb is behind St. Irene's. Oleg set himself up as prince in Kiev, and declared that it should be the mother of Russian cities. The Varangians, Slavs, and others who accompanied him were called Ruses. Oleg began to build stockaded towns, and imposed tribute on the Slavs, the Kravichians, and the Marians. He commanded that Novgorod should pay the Varangians tribute to the amount of 300 grivni a year for the preservation of peace. This tribute was paid to the Varangians until the death of Yaroslav. Oleg began military operations against the Drevlians, and after conquering them, he imposed upon them the tribute of a black marten skin apiece. Oleg attacked the Severians and conquered them. He imposed a light tribute upon them and forbade their further payment of tribute to the Khazars, on the grounds that there was no reason for them to pay it as long as the Khazars were his enemies. Oleg sent messengers to the Rodomikians to inquire to whom they paid tribute. Upon their reply that they paid tribute to the Khazars, he directed them to render it to himself instead, and they accordingly paid him a shilling apiece, the same amount that they had paid the Khazars. Thus, Oleg established his authority over the Polyanians, the Drevlians, the Severians, and the Rodomikians, but he waged war with the Ulikians and the Tiversians. Unquote. That's a lot of names for a lot of local tribes, but the long and short of it is that by Oleg's death in the year 912, he rules over two lands, 
the princedoms of Kiev and Novgorod, which collectively reach from modern-day Ukraine in the south up through Belarus and into northwest uh, modern-day Russia. And this whole region becomes known as Kievan Rus. And in addition to his conquests, Oleg also makes a trade agreement with the Byzantine Empire. By using their trade network of rivers between Byzantium and Scandinavia, the Kievan Rus become a prosperous people. Not all is peaceful, though. They butt up against the Khazar tribes on the neighboring Pontic steppe to their southeast, so they have to keep their military skills sharp. Upon Oleg's death, Rurik's son Igor finally gets the chance to rule. He spars with the Byzantines a few times, which results in a formal peace treaty with even more favorable trading terms for the Kievan Rus. Then, in 945, Igor's reign comes to an abrupt end. The neighboring Drevlian tribe has stopped paying tribute and instead is supporting a local warlord and rival to the Rus. Igor leads his army to the Drevlian capital city of Iskorosten, where he overawes them with large numbers of Rus troops and convinces them to pay tribute. But after leaving, he decides that he wants even more tribute, and he turns around, uh, leaving his army and going with just his personal bodyguard to go renegotiate. And seeing the Kievan prince without his army, the Drevlians don't agree to pay him more tribute. Uh, they surround him and kill him, and by some accounts he is even captured and tortured to death. Now, I'm going to tell this next story, number one, because it's one of my favorite historical anecdotes, but number two, because it shows the kind of fire that burns in the hearts of these early Russian rulers. The Drevlians send a delegation to Queen Olga, Igor's bereaved widow, to let her know that her husband is dead. And the delegation even has the nerve to suggest that she come back to Iskorosten with them and unite their peoples by marrying their leader, Prince Mal, the guy who had just killed her husband. Olga pretends to go along with the proposal, but she tells the delegates that she wants to give them a formal reception the next evening in front of all her people. According to the Russian Chronicle, she tells them, quote, Return now to your boat, and remain there with an aspect of arrogance. I shall send for you on the morrow, and you shall say, We will not ride on horses nor go on foot. Carry us in our boat, and you shall be carried in your boat. Unquote. Throughout the night and the following day, she has her workers dig a deep ditch inside of her reception hall. And when her messengers invite the Drevlian delegates in, they demand to be carried, and so they're carried inside in their boat, and Olga's people simply drop them into the ditch, and she has them buried alive. Now, for some people, this might be enough of a response to the Drevlians for murdering her husband and sending a marriage proposal, but not for Olga. Queen Olga is about to give us a master class in revenge. And she sends a delegation of her own to Prince Mal and tells him that she likes his offer, but that her people would rebel if the offer appeared too insulting and made her look weak. She needs him to send some of the leading men from his tribe, some VIPs, to deliver his proposal, so her people will see that he's serious and he's paying her respect. So Prince Mal sends some of his leading men to Kiev to deliver an even more formal proposal. While they are en route, Olga has a new bathhouse built, a beautiful timber building, and when the delegation arrives, she refuses to meet until they've had a bath and washed away the filth from their travels. Well, as soon as these Drevlian VIPs are inside the bathhouse, the Rus bar the doors, and burn down the buildings with the Drevlians inside. Then, 
Olga sends another message to Prince Mal, accepting his marriage proposal. But she says that before she can go through with the marriage, she needs to follow the proper mourning process and go to the city where her husband was killed and mourn for him. So she goes to the Drevlian capital of Iskarostin, uh, and she brings with her no soldiers, but a large group of attendants and servants. And when the Drevlians ask where their VIPs and dignitaries are, she says, well, they're several hours behind with my soldiers, but I wanted to come ahead with my servants and uh, get on with the morning ritual. So uh, this puts the Drevlians at ease, and they let her into the city, and she mourns at Igor's grave. Then she says that she will now honor the Drevlians by feasting with them and having her attendants and servants do all the serving. So a feast commences, and when the Drevlians are all good and drunk, Olga goes full-on red wedding and orders her servants to kill them all. And according to the Russian Chronicle, over 5,000 Drevlians are massacred, although Prince Mal doesn't actually live in Iskarostin, so he's not one of the dead. Olga returns to Kiev and prepares for open war. And if the Chronicle is to be believed, she takes her young son, Igor's heir Sviatoslav, with her. And the two armies meet in the open field. They're lined up across from each other, and Sviatoslav ceremoniously starts the battle by hurling a spear at the enemy, although because he's only five or six years old and this is a heavy spear, the spear barely goes further than his horse's ears. Nonetheless, this is a sufficient command for the Rus' army to charge, and the Drevlians flee and they take refuge in the city of Iskarostin, where this all began. They don't just go to Iskarostin because it's their biggest city or because it's their capital. They go there because it has walls, and it will be difficult for Olga to attack. Now, the Russian chronicle says, quote, Olga remained there a year without being able to take the city. And then she thought out this plan. She sent into the town the following message. Why do you persist in holding out? All your cities have surrendered to me and submitted to tribute, so that the inhabitants now cultivate their fields and their lands in peace. But you had rather die of hunger without submitting to tribute. The Drevlians replied that they would be glad to submit to tribute, but that she was still bent on avenging her husband. Olga then answered, since I have already avenged the misfortune of my husband twice on the occasions when your messengers came to Kiev, and a third time when I held a funeral feast for him, I do not desire further revenge, but am anxious to receive a small tribute. After I have made peace with you, I shall return home again. The Drevlians then inquired what she desired of them, and expressed their readiness to pay honeys and furs. Olga retorted that, at the moment, they had neither honey nor furs, but that she had one small request to make. Give me three pigeons, she said, and three sparrows from each house. I do not desire to impose a heavy tribute like my husband, but I require only this small gift from you, for you are impoverished by the siege. Unquote. Now, the Drevlians must have a habit of keeping small birds around because apparently after a year under siege, they are able to produce all of these sparrows and pigeons. And after the birds are delivered, Olga tells the Drevlians to go home and go to bed and her army will depart the first thing in the morning. Come nightfall, she has her men tie little balls of sulfur to the birds' legs and releases them. And as birds will do, they fly back home. And the sulfur starts little fires all over the city of Iskarostin. And there are so many small fires that there's nothing the Drevlians can do but run from their wooden city. And when they come out, Olga's troops attack them and slaughter many of them and take the elders hostage. Then, when the city has burned to the ground, 
she forces the survivors to pay tribute. This helps to solidify the Rus' reputation as fearsome warriors. Ironically, Queen Olga isn't only known for taking acts of revenge to historic lengths. A few years later, sometime in the 950s, Olga goes on a state visit to Constantinople, and after meeting with the patriarch, she converts to Christianity, and now she is a saint of the Orthodox Church with the title Equal to the Apostles, which means that in the Church's view, she has had as much influence on the spread of Christianity as any one of the Apostles. And under her reign, Byzantine missionaries will spread Christianity like wildfire throughout the Russian lands. Regardless, this whole incident goes to show you that you really don't want to mess with the Rus during this time period. Because of their fearsome reputation, Kievan Rus warriors will also become a valued part of the Byzantine army. What begins with a few hundred mercenaries serving on an ad hoc basis turns into a full-fledged elite guard in the year 988. That year, Byzantine Emperor Basil II asks for military aid from Vladimir I, Prince of Kiev. In exchange for concluding a royal marriage with the emperor's sister, Vladimir sends 6,000 troops to the emperor and agrees himself to convert to Christianity. This military unit would become a permanent feature of the Byzantine army. Known as the Varangian Guard, they would swear personal loyalty to the Byzantine emperor. In later years, the guard would consist of all kinds of Scandinavian warriors, including Normans and Saxons. Vladimir and Olga are not the only Kievan Rus people to convert to Christianity. Following their example, and with increased cultural interchange between their lands and the Greeks, many Rus people become Christians, and instead of Byzantine missionaries, most of the priests and missionaries in Kievan Rus are of local Rus stock. And when the Christian church splits into its eastern and western halves, they continue to follow the Eastern Byzantine Greek tradition. Over time, over the years and generations, the Kievan Rus become less centralized and are more of a loose confederation of princedoms. They even have different forms of government. By the mid-1100s, the Novgorod Republic is as democratic a society as you'll see, with elected town councils and even an elected prince who is subject to recall by popular referendum. Meanwhile, princedoms like the Principality of Ryazan are more autocratic. But even as they become more politically divided, the Kievan Rus share a common cultural identity, and over the centuries their aristocratic Scandinavian leaders intermarry with the local Slavic population, so there are no real ethnic tensions in their neck of the woods. But by the early 1200s, things are looking grim. The Kievan Rus have to deal with three crises that will drastically alter the region and ultimately lead to the creation of modern-day Russia. First, they're coming under pressure from the Crusaders. See, in the second half of the 12th century, the Pope authorizes a crusade against the pagan tribes living around the Baltic, in what we now call the Baltic states, right? Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, that general area. But these crusaders, like the ones in the Middle East, sometimes treat Orthodox Christians as harshly as non-Christians, and there's a lot of tension on that front, which had previously been a calm area. The second crisis the Kievan Rus face is more crusaders. In 1204, the armies of the Fourth Crusade sack Constantinople, and the ancient Byzantine Empire is carved up into a bunch of smaller kingdoms. Greece and Anatolia, the 
heart of the empire had long been the wealthiest region in the world west of India. Now, all of a sudden, it's not so wealthy. It would be as if a meteorite came in and obliterated Silicon Valley. And overnight, the trade from the Baltic to the Black Sea goes from a raging torrent to a weak trickle. Except for the Novgorod Republic, which actually has a little bit of coastline on the Baltic at this time and can partake in sea trade there, much of the land falls into poverty. The third crisis is the one that will ultimately break the Kievan Rus, or nearly so. But if your nation is going to be broken, there's no shame in having it go out this way, because I'm talking about one of the greatest geostrategic forces of all time, the Mongol Empire. And this is where Siberia first comes into our story, because it's the Mongols who first unite some of these people. In 1207, as Genghis Khan is fighting his epic war in China against the Western Xi dynasty, his son Jochi subjugates a number of the tribes in southeastern Siberia, around Mongolia's northern frontier. And these people speak Mongol languages, they have cultures similar to the Mongols, so they're easy to absorb into the empire. And after this initial conquest, it seems like Jochi is able to raise a grand total of 30,000 troops from his new subjects, although knowing the Mongols, that's going to be nearly all of the men. Remember, not a lot of people in this area. As Genghis conquers south and east, Jochi conquers west through Siberia, subjugating tribe after tribe of the people in the southern part of Siberia, and eventually crossing the Ural Mountains into Eastern Europe. In 1223, Jochi's generals make a reconnaissance in force into the Rus' territory. They defeat a coalition of Rus' armies sent to meet them, but then they turn back since their reconnaissance mission is complete. In 1237, after Jochi's death, his son Batu Khan returns to Eastern Europe, and over the course of five years, from 1237 to 1242, almost all of Kievan Rus falls under Mongol domination. The Small principalities form a series of coalitions, but they are not very numerous or mobile. And the Mongols flip the script on them. They take a defensive posture in the warm months when the Rus can use their rivers to maneuver. This is the traditional campaigning season in this part of the world. And in the winter months, when... It's normally not campaigning season when the Rus have a hard time moving around. The Mongols use the frozen rivers as roads for their mounted armies. The city of Kiev is burned to the ground. So is Moscow, which is only a small town at this point in time. So is every significant Russian settlement outside of Novgorod, which has by now become a powerful merchant republic, the Venice of the North, if you will. In the late 1200s, a couple of generations later, the Mongol leaders are no longer sons or even grandsons of Genghis Khan. They're only distant cousins to each other, and family bonds no longer hold the massive empire together. It breaks up, and the westernmost portion becomes known as the Golden Horde. This is an Islamicized, miniaturized version of the Mongol Empire. And it is still a vast empire, stretching from the northern coast of the Black Sea, far north into modern-day Belarus, and as far west as modern-day Kazakhstan and north into much of Siberia. And a lot of that is the Kievan Rus lands, and those Kievan Rus who are not directly under the Khan's rule are forced to pay tribute, just as their ancestors had forced other peoples to pay them tribute. 
Right? These are tributary buffer states designed by the Khan to create a barrier between himself and the more robust Christian powers of Central Europe. He's going to set up some puppet states along his border. It's at this point that the Grand Duchy of Moscow first comes onto the stage. It is established in 1263 when Alexander Nevsky, the Grand Prince of Vladimir dies. Now, Vladimir is the largest city left in Russia outside of Novgorod, and Nevsky is also the Prince of Novgorod, and for good measure, he's Prince of Kiev. He is basically the ruler of all the Rus who are not directly under the Khan's boot. And he has managed to keep the peace his entire life, paying tribute to the Golden Horde as he must, and maintaining the loyalty of the people because of his lineage. He is a descendant of Rurik, the first Rus prince, and when he dies, his titles are given to his four sons. The three oldest become the princes of Novgorod, Kiev, and Vladimir, respectively. But the fourth, Daniel, receives only a small portion of land, the new duchy of Moscow, which is carved out of Vladimir's territory. At the time, Moscow is a small trading city on the banks of the Moskva River. The Moskva is a tributary of the Oka River, which eventually flows into the Volga River and into the Caspian Sea. So, in theory... Moscow is a great place for trade. Unfortunately, more than half of the Moskva River's water comes from the spring thaw. By late summer, it's often too shallow for shipping, and it's frozen over from late fall through early spring. In fact, the Moskva will remain a seasonal river for shipping purposes until the 1930s, when the Soviets will divert some water from the upper Volga to feed more water into the river and keep the water level more or less consistent year-round. Based on all this, you probably wouldn't expect the Duchy of Moscow, or as its princes would start calling it, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, you wouldn't expect it to amount to anything. But Daniel is a talented general, and quickly conquers a handful of other petty princes in his area. By the time of Daniel's death in 1303, the Grand Duchy of Moscow controls the entire Moskva River Basin. And you might be asking how he's able to do this as a vassal to the Khan. Well, the thing is, the Khan doesn't really care. As long as you're not going to war with him and you're paying tribute, you make war on your neighbors all you want. You're, you're not part of the Khanate. You're just a tributary state. And because of this, Daniel is able to make a bunch of conquests. Daniel's successors are savvy politicians as well as skilled military leaders. And while many of the Rus princes are disloyal or rebellious against their Muslim Mongol overlords, the early princes of Moscow are some of the Khan's most loyal tributaries. Daniel's son, Yuri, even marries the Khan's sister and becomes the Khan's official collector of tribute from the other Rus. Yuri dies in 1325, hated by pretty much everyone in Russia, but he has laid the foundation for Moscow's success. Yuri is succeeded by his brother, Ivan I, who is known as Ivan Kalita, which literally means Ivan Moneybag. He gets this nickname by buying up all the lands around the Duchy of Moscow, continually expanding its territory. Ivan has a policy of allowing any Rus to settle in his lands, and even buys back Russian slaves from the Mongols and settles them in his new territory. This in turn grows his own tax base and gives him more people from whom to recruit soldiers. And this pattern of Muscovite growth 
continues until the late 1300s. In the 1370s, the Golden Horde has come out of a period of civil war, and the new Khan wishes to assert his authority, so he grants the Duchy of Vladimir to the Prince of Novgorod. Now, from the Golden Horde's perspective, the Duchy of Vladimir includes the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. They have not changed their view of these things, and so this would effectively eliminate the Dukes of Moscow and give authority over most of independent Russia to the Prince of Novgorod, and unsurprisingly, the nobles of Moscow refuse to go along with this. And the Duke, Dmitri, refuses to give up his claim. At first, he tries diplomacy. Look, my ancestors worked well for your ancestors. What, what's the problem here? Can we reason this out? But the Khan is insistent, so eventually Dmitri goes to war. And at the Battle of Kulikovo in 1380, the Muscovite army inflicts a shocking defeat against the army of the Golden Horde. The effects of the battle seem to be short-lived. Just two years later, in 1382, a Mongol force leads a punitive expedition against Moscow and kills more than 20,000 people. But the city cannot be completely destroyed because Dmitri has built a fortification on Borovitsky Hill, the center of Moscow. Made from limestone, this fortification is called the Kremlin, which means the fortress within a city. And it has expanded many times over the centuries. This Kremlin is the seat of government for the princes of Moscow, and will also be the seat of government for most of the czars, and for the Soviet government, and for the modern Russian president. After the sack of their capital city, the Grand Duchy of Moscow is once again a vassal to the Golden Horde, but they remain independent, and their position has changed. Before, the princes of Moscow had grown their power through slavish loyalty to the Khans. Now that the Khans are getting weaker, Moscow is becoming more and more indispensable to them. As a valued military ally, they continue to annex other small Russian princedoms, all with the Khan's approval. But the Battle of Kulikovo also has a morale effect upon the Russian people. After nearly two centuries of subjugation, they have gotten a new taste for self-determination. Dmitri becomes a folk hero, a symbol of Orthodox Christian resistance against their Muslim overlords. Over the course of the early 1400s, the Golden Horde breaks up into several smaller khanates, including places that sound awfully familiar to modern ears, like the Uzbek Khanate and the Crimean Khanate. And the most relevant of these is the Kazan Khanate. This is the northwesternmost of the Golden Horde's successor states, and it's the one that still neighbors the Grand Duchy of Muscovy. The Kazan Khanate stretches from Muscovy to the Ural Mountains, the great mountain range that runs from the Arctic south almost to the Aral Sea. These mountains are the dividing line between Europe and Asia, and between European Russia and Siberia. But despite the fact that it's just a portion of the original Golden Horde, itself was a portion of the Mongol Empire. Nonetheless, the Kazan Khanate is still a major power, and it holds enough sway that the Grand Duchy of Moscow needs to be careful. So, Prince Ivan III, known as Ivan the Great, doesn't mess with the Kazan Khanate. Instead, he uses his larger kingdom to conquer Novgorod the last significant independent statelet existing in European Russia. 
And with this, the Grand Duchy of Moscow is now a major world power. In 1480, Ivan the Great is ready to call the Khan's bluff. He refuses to pay tribute. And when the Khan leads an army to force him to submit, he raises his own army to respond. The two sides face off near the frontier, with each side formed up on opposite banks of the Ugra River. This event, known as the Great Stand at the Ugra River, is a bit anticlimactic. With winter coming on, the river is about to freeze and the sides will be forced to fight. Ivan doesn't want to fight in the open field and withdraws to a narrow clearing where the Mongols' horse archers won't be able to surround him. The Khan is unwilling to fight without being able to take advantage of his troops' maneuverability, so he withdraws. Nonetheless, this year, 1480, marks the year of the Grand Duchy of Moscow's official independence from the Mongols. Maybe Ivan didn't win a battle against the Khan, but he didn't lose either. And if he doesn't lose, he's not going to pay tribute, is he? The Khan does not return to try and impose tribute again, and over the next several years, Ivan seizes the neighboring Grand Duchy of Tver, his most significant remaining rival. Through shrewd diplomacy, he outright inherits the smaller principality of Ryazan and absorbs the still smaller princedoms of Rostov and Yaroslavl. He also fights against the Lithuanians along his western border and gains some small territories there. By the end of Ivan the Great's reign in 1505, not only has the Grand Duchy of Moscow gained its independence once and for all, it has tripled in size, dwarfing any other power in Europe. Ivan the Great's son, Vasily III, reigns from 1505 to 1533 and presides over a period of relative peace and tranquility. He absorbs the last remaining independent Russian principalities, including the Peskov Republic, finally reuniting the Russian people. But these are small conquests in the grand scheme of things, and for this reason, Vasily III is often referred to as Vasily the Adequate. But his son, Ivan IV, is an entirely different matter. Ivan IV, known to history as Ivan the Terrible, begins his reign in 1533 at only three years old. Obviously, the Grand Duchy of Moscow is ruled by a Regency Council during this period, and it's tough to get a full picture of his childhood, but it seems as if his guardians may not have his best interests at heart. In one letter, Ivan writes, quote, My brother Yuri of blessed memory and me, they brought up like vagrants and children of the poorest. What have I suffered for want of garments and food? Unquote. Well, whatever his childhood experiences, Ivan is crowned on January 16th, 1647. And at his coronation, he is crowned Tsar of all the Russias. The word Tsar in the Slavic tradition is a rendition of Caesar, a truly ancient imperial title. What Ivan and the princes who crown him are saying is that he's not just some prince, or even a king. He's an emperor with a large realm and many people to govern. And the title Tsar will last for another 270 years, until the last Tsar, I might even say the last Caesar, Nicholas II, is overthrown during the Russian Revolution. Speaking of Nicholas II, there's an interesting coincidence, you might say. See, Ivan the Terrible marries his first wife, Anastasia Romanova, 
merely two weeks after his coronation. She is a member of the Romanov family, who will eventually replace the Rurikid family, the descendants of Rurik, as leaders of Russia. And it's ironic that the first Russian Tsarina has nearly the same name as Anastasia Romanov, the youngest Russian princess killed by the communists in 1918, who has inspired so many stories and conspiracy theories. Anyway... One of the first things Ivan does is to create a professional army. Previously, the army has consisted of levied troops who are not always reliable. Ivan's professional infantry are called the Streltsy, which literally means shooters. As you might have guessed, given the name, these men are armed with muskets, but they also carry axes with them in case they get stuck into melee combat. These are combined with traditional Russian cavalry, and Ivan also establishes an official artillery corps, bringing his army into technological parity with his Polish and Lithuanian neighbors. In 1549, he establishes the Zemsky Sobor. The Zemsky Sobor is a parliamentary body consisting of representatives from the three feudal classes, right? the nobility, the clergy, and the common people, which really means the merchant class. And this is mostly a rubber stamp body, but it does mark Russia's first national assembly, and it's a big step towards centralizing rule in Moscow. The nobility still have power, but it's not exercised at home in the provinces. It's exercised in the capital through their votes in the Zemsky Sobor. Or at least that's what Ivan IV intends. In 1550, the Zemsky Sobor approves a proclamation called the Sudebnik of 1550. This is a change to the Russian legal code that removes power of the judiciary from the nobility and instead gives it to judges who are appointed by the Tsar. Before, if you were going to court on some case, you had better hope that you're not trying to sue your feudal overlord because you were going to lose because they run the court. Right now, it is a judge appointed by the czar who will hear your case, at least in theory, you're more likely to get a fair hearing. And this not only further centralizes Ivan's power, right? Now he controls the judges, not the nobles, but it also makes him popular with the people and with the merchant class, since it stops feudal lords from acting as judge, jury, and executioner. Right? Under the Sudebnik of 1550, local town and village councils are also given the authority to distribute tax revenues. This is another role that was typically held by the nobility. What Ivan wants is to make sure that none of his nobles are strong enough or independent enough to raise any kind of rebellion. Remember, this new Tsardom of Russia was only established a few minutes ago in historical terms. There's nothing stopping some breakaway duke from trying to uh, start a separatist movement up in Novgorod or something like that. And so Ivan weakens them. Understandably, Ivan's policies will make some of the nobility angry. A major prince, Andrei Kurbsky, defects to the Lithuanians, and in 1560, Tsarina Anastasia is killed, possibly by poison. And this series of events causes Ivan to change his policies. He becomes even more autocratic. He begins seizing land from the nobility outright and granting it to his personal guard, known as the Oprichniki. Now, in theory, this is supposed to defang the nobility while further enthusing the peasant class. Ivan wants the people to be dancing in the streets. Yay, my feudal overlord is gone. Long live Tsar Ivan. But in practice, 
Because these new Opechniki are only answerable to Ivan, they end up being worse than the old nobility. They raise rents, they do other things that make the people angry, and this leads to a whole series of internal disasters that I'm not even going to get into, but suffice it to say that Ivan's response is a big part of why he's called Ivan the Terrible. Throughout Ivan's reign, he's not just dealing with domestic discord. Uh, Russia is also at war with the Lithuanians and other neighbors almost constantly. And I'm not going to even talk about that either, uh, besides pointing out that at this time Lithuania is a pretty big country and very much a match for Russia. But I sat down today to talk about the Russian conquest of Siberia, and we've finally gotten to the reign of Ivan the Terrible, the guy who makes that happen. Or at least whose policies allow for it to happen. See, the first step towards Siberia is the leap to the Ural Mountains. Remember, those are the barrier between Europe and Asia, and so far, few Russians have ever crossed them. And for now, this stretch of land between European Russia and the Urals is occupied by the Kazan Khanate, those Mongol overlords the Russians threw off under the rule of Ivan III. At this time, the Kazan Khanate is weak, and Russia had already invaded them in 1550. They had installed a pro-Russian leader named Shah Ali, but Ali is overthrown the next year in 1551 by an anti-Russian leader named Yagadar Muhammad, who steps in as Khan. In 1552, a year after that, Ivan leads a force of nearly 150,000 men, including 150 cannons and an invasion. And in August, they besiege the capital city of Kazan. In previous Russian sieges, the Khans had kept contingents of horsemen outside the city to hit any attackers from their flanks. But after the 1550 invasion, the Russians had built a fort about 10 miles up the river from the city to prevent the Mongols from using local woods as cover. And without any Mongol forces outside the city to harass them, the Russians are able to take their time, set up a proper siege, and use their artillery to destroy the few Kazani cannons which are on the walls. Then... They build a 40-foot platform and move cannons up onto it for added range and precision and concentrate their fire on weak points in the wall. But ultimately, it is not artillery, but sappers who bring down the wall. They tunnel underneath and undermine it on October 2nd. This allows Russian troops to enter the city, and forces the defenders to fall back to their inner keep. And eleven days later, after more than six weeks of fighting, the inner keep falls. And the defenders try to escape, but most are killed, including Khan Yagadar Muhammad. Following the siege, tens of thousands of Kazani warriors and civilians are killed, and Ivan leaves a Russian garrison in charge of the city. Thousands of Russian prisoners of war have been kept by the Kazani as slaves after previous wars. They are freed, and many return to Russia. But many decide to settle in the immediate area, which increases the local Russian population. Following their defeat, the Khans build two new fortresses nearby the city of Kazan, and continue to harass local Russian traders and settlers. It takes four more years of guerrilla war and targeted attacks by the local garrison, but in 1556, the last Kazani fortress finally falls, and for all intents and purposes, the Mongols are pushed back behind the Urals. Also in 1556, Ivan IV completes his conquest of the Khanate of Astrakhan. This is a smaller territory, but it lies along the Volga River. 
Right? That river that the Moskva River ultimately feeds into, well, the Volga is a long river, and it runs all the way to the Caspian Sea. And this conquest of Astrakhan gives the Russians control over all of it. Reason being, some of the Volga's tributaries start to the north and east, up near the Ural Mountain foothills. So, in this one year, 1556, Ivan IV is number one, conquered the territory up to the Urals, right? The very eastern edge of Europe. And simultaneously, he has captured the rest of the Volga River, which gives him a way to transport goods from this newly conquered territory, uh, number one, to foreign markets off the Caspian Sea, but number two, uh, back up towards Moscow, elsewhere in the Russian Empire, uh, or wherever else this river network can take you. And now the Russians can start exploiting the natural resources from the Urals, and possibly beyond. Now, we talked about furs a lot in the last episode, but let's just quickly recap for anybody who's new or missed that one. At this time in history, the world has come out of a period known as the Medieval Warm Period, and has begun a period known as the Little Ice Age. And the temperatures are around three and a half degrees Fahrenheit chillier than they are today. And with Europe coming out of medieval poverty and into Renaissance prosperity, demand for furs is skyrocketing. Obviously, Russia is a cold region and there's plenty of local demand, but the Russians are having trouble getting their goods to market. The Baltic coast is occupied by the Lithuanians right now, so there's no real way for the Russians to get their furs into Western Europe, even if they wanted to. And they do want to. But, see, a few years earlier, backing up a bit, in 1553... Even as the Kazan Khanate and the Khanate of Astrakhan have yet to be defeated, yet another market opens up for Russian furs. See, that summer, an English trade ship under the command of explorer Richard Chancellor lands at the White Sea port of Arkhangelsk, which at the time isn't really a port, it's just a tiny fishing village. This area, the White Sea, is an area of sea located north and east of Scandinavia, and it's frozen over much of the year. Why are the British there? Well, Chancellor is leading an expedition to discover a northern sea route to China. He figures if there's a way to get to China by northern routes, even if it's only open in the summer months... Man, that is way faster than going all the way south and down around Africa to get over to China. You just go over the top of Asia, right? Interesting idea. That's why Chancellor is there. Uh, and instead, he receives an emissary from Ivan IV inviting him to come visit Moscow. With the weather already turning chilly... Doesn't look like he's going to be getting much further uh, along the northern route this year. Uh, Chancellor agrees, and he has brought most of the 600-mile journey to Moscow by horse-drawn sleigh. And when he gets there, he meets with Tsar Ivan, and Ivan tells Chancellor that the Russians are eager to establish a trade relationship. And Chancellor agrees. Now, he is an explorer. He does not have ambassadorial authority, but he trades with the Tsar for some furs. He promises to take them back to England, consult with the government, and come back later on. And in 1555, he does return, this time bringing English wool to trade for even more Russian furs. 
And after further negotiations, he returns to England once more, comes back again in 1556. And this year, the Tsar sends him back to England with an ambassador. Unfortunately, Chancellor's small fleet is blown off course by a storm and ends up wrecking off the coast of Scotland. Chancellor himself is killed along with most members of the expedition, and the fur is at the bottom of the North Sea, but the Russian ambassador is among the few survivors, and for the first time, formal diplomatic relations are established between Russia and England. This opens the floodgates for Russian fur exports, not just to England, but to other countries like the Dutch that are friendly with England. Incidentally, it opens the floodgates for other exports as well, including salt. And that's where the conquest of Siberia begins. With ordinary, everyday salt and the people who produce it. See, like any powerful leader, Ivan the Terrible has rich friends who can help him fund his government. And one such wealthy friend is the Stroganov family. Yes, the same family that gave us Beef Stroganov also helped to fund Ivan the Terrible. The family originated in Russia's Arctic North. Merchants who operated a salt mine and obtained a healthy profit. Since then, the family has moved its main business to the city of Nizhny Novgorod, which sits east of Moscow. In 1558, the family purchases tracts of lands along the Perm and Kama rivers, which is a major confluence. The Perm flows down from the foothills to the Urals, while the Kama begins near Arkhangelsk in the north, and after they meet, both join the Volga and flow to the Caspian Sea. At the same time, the Stroganovs get a license to produce saltpeter, a vital ingredient in gunpowder, which is becoming more and more important for national security reasons in these times. If you don't have gunpowder, you don't have a modern army. That's a problem. So it's very easy for the Stroganovs to get this license to make saltpeter, and not only have they established a prime trade location with access to furs, English trade, and the Caspian Sea, but they've also made themselves more valuable to the Tsar as a producer of military material. Moreover, the Chuyasava River, which also lies in this new Stroganov territory, flows into Siberia, and this serves as a lure to fur traders, and even to common peasants who will pay their landlords the required tax to free themselves from their land and then move east in search of fur. Now, to understand why people are willing to just up and take off into the wilderness and search for some pelts, it's important to understand just how valuable some of these furs are. And this particular account comes from several decades later, but it goes to illustrate just what the stakes are for these people. In his book, Glorious Misadventures, Nikolai Razanov and the Dream of a Russian America, British author Owen Matthews writes, quote, Fur, in a cold and poorly heated world, was not only a symbol of wealth, but also a bringer of comfort and, in the sense of Russia, literally a lifesaver. Fine furs were staggeringly valuable. In 1623, one Siberian official reported the theft of two black fox pelts, one worth 30 rubles, the other 80. The thief could have bought himself 50 Siberian acres, a cabin, five good horses, ten cows, and twenty sheep on the proceeds and still have had some of his ill-gotten money left over. No wonder painters of the new bourgeoisie, from Jean Van Eyck in the Netherlands to Sebastiano del Piombo in Rome, painted their subjects in sable collars in such loving detail. They were often worth more than the artist could hope to make in years. Unquote. The conquest that happens next occurs almost by accident. See, 
Russia is now adjacent to yet another Mongol successor state, the Khanate of Siberia. And the Khanate of Siberia is the only organized state between the Urals and the Pacific, at least at these northern latitudes. And as you'll remember from earlier, now that we're in Siberia, we're talking about a very sparsely populated area. These people are mostly semi-nomadic indigenous tribes with an Islamic Mongol ruling class that rules by exacting tribute, just like the Kazan Khanate, just like the Russians had done for so many years. Now, prior to 1571, the Siber Khanate is a vassal of the Tsar. They recognize that they are much weaker than their new Russian neighbors, and they pay tribute. But then they rebel. What happens next isn't entirely clear, because the people in the Siberia Khanate don't really do a lot of writing, but uh, the Siberians start capturing Russian fur traders and enslaving them. These Russian people are taking their boats down the river to lurk for furs, and the Siberians just start rounding them up and making them slaves. And the Russians are willing to tolerate a little bit of this, but eventually the Sibir Khanate makes an attack on a Stroganov trade outpost in the Ural Mountains. They have just messed with one of Russia's most powerful families. And the Stroganovs decide that they're going to retaliate and wage their own little private war. To do this, they hire a guy named Yermak Timofeyevich, an infamous river pirate, and his small mercenary army of Cossacks. The Cossacks themselves are a study in nationalism because they're a self-defined people. Many are Central Asian and even Mongol steppe archers who roam the river basins, living their old nomadic lifestyle. Many are runaway Russian peasants who have fled their farms looking for freedom in the wilderness. In these times, this desire for freedom often leads them to become mercenaries. The descendants of horse archers fight as experienced cavalry who know how to deal with steppe archers because they come from the same stock. Meanwhile, the infantry fight in a similar fashion to the Russian Streltsy, with muskets along with an array of melee weapons to engage at closer range. And Yermak Timofeyevich is a fascinating character. See, he is a wanted river pirate. He has a price on his head, both inside Russia and in the Crimean Khanate to the south, where he has also plied his trade. His only real choices are death and exile, so he is the perfect guy to send on a one-way mission beyond the frontier. And when I say one-way mission, what I mean is that it doesn't seem as if this is intended to be a conquest. The Stroganovs are hiring a mercenary to make some attacks on the Siber Khanate and make them think twice before attacking Stroganov trade outposts again. They're not planning on an outright annexation of an entire nation, so the conquest of the Cyber Khanate happens almost by accident. Now, Yermak has some important advantages here. Although numbers are fuzzy, it seems like he only has a few men. Depending on the source, this could be anywhere from 540 men to 5,000, which seems awfully small to invade such a large area, but, as we discussed, there's not a ton of population here. Not only that, but this is an area on the fringes of civilization, and the Siberians hardly have any gunpowder. They mostly fight as cavalry archers, and the ruling minority does all the fighting. Some of the local indigenous people will also fight against Yermak's Cossacks, but they're very lightly armed and can't do much more than launch the occasional raid. Yermak begins his expedition in 1581, and at first he gets pushed back by the Khan's forces, 
But slowly and deliberately he works his way up major rivers, out of the Urals and into Siberia proper. He keeps winning small victories, and in late summer every year, he will build a timber fortress for the winter. These fortresses don't just serve as winter quarters for his troops, they serve as part of a supply line, and he can leave garrisons in them to make sure that the friendly local tribes remain friendly. Sometime around October of 1582, Yermak's expedition reaches the Siber capital. After a brief engagement, the Khan's allies start fleeing one by one, right? These lightly armed local tribal troops. And by the end of the day, Yermak has unexpectedly conquered the capital of the Siber Khanate. He takes fur pelts as tribute for many of the local tribes and sends them not to his Stroganov employers, but directly to the Tsar. Yermak is playing a little bit of politics here, isn't he? See, all of this is done, this whole invasion of the Siber Khanate, it's done without Ivan the Terrible's permission. At first, he is displeased with the Stroganov venture into Siberia. As part of their charter, the Stroganovs are supposed to be defending uh, these territories, uh, particularly in the northern Urals, and with uh, them spending all of their money, uh, their military funding on Yermak's expedition, uh, there have been some raids from neighboring tribes onto a number of Russian trade outposts. When Ivan hears that a messenger from Yermak is coming to speak with him, he intends to have the messenger killed, but when he sees all of these pelts that the messenger has brought, he immediately recognizes the commercial opportunities available in Siberia. And Instead of beheading this messenger, he dispatches official reinforcements from the Imperial Army to secure the territory. And this is necessary, because Kuchum Khan is still alive. He's lost his capital, but he's out in the countryside rallying his forces and loyal allies to fight a guerrilla war. In his book, East of the Sun, The Epic Conquest and Tragic History of Siberia, American historian Benson Bobrick says the following. And just to clarify, when he says Tatars, he means the Mongol descendants who are ruling this area. Bobrick writes, quote, Back in Siberia, Yermak struggled to extend his authority up the Irtish, as natives were made to swear allegiance by kissing a bloody sword. Those who resisted were hanged upside down by one foot, which meant an agonizing death. Yet in his own way, Yermak tried to Christianize the tribes. In one contest of power, a local wizard ripped open his own stomach with a knife, then miraculously healed the wound by smearing it with grass. Yermak simply tossed the local wooden totems on the fire. By the end of summer 1584, his jurisdiction extended almost to the Ob River. In one daring sortie, he had managed to surprise and capture Kuchum's nephew, Mametkul, in effect, the Khan's minister of war. But meanwhile, the Tatar raiders who had attacked Cherdin and other Russian settlements returned, and by attrition, the strength of Yermak's band declined. In November, 500 long-awaited reinforcements tramped into Isker on snowshoes but having brought no provisions of their own, rapidly consumed Yermak's reserves. During the long winter, part of the garrison starved, and some were forced to eat the bodies of their dead companions. Aware of Yermak's dire circumstances, Kuchum's adherents stepped up attacks on foraging parties in the spring. In two grievous blows to the garrison's hopes for survival, twenty Cossacks were killed as they dozed by a lake while Kultso and 40 others were lured to a friendship banquet and massacred. In early August 1585, a trap was baited for Yermak himself. 
informed that an unescorted caravan from Bukhara was nearing Irtish, he hastened with a company of Cossacks to meet it. But finding the report untrue, that knight was obliged to bivouac on an island in midstream. A wild storm arose and drove the watchmen into their tents. A party of natives disembarked unobserved, attacked, and killed the Cossacks almost to a man. Yermak managed to struggle into his armor and fight his way to the embankment, but the boat floated out of his reach, and as he plunged into the water after it, his armor bore him down beneath the waves. Out of the 1,340 men who had thus advanced into Siberia, no more than 90 remained. This hard-pressed remnant rapidly retreated to the Urals, where, as they made their way through a mountain pass, they met a hundred Streltsy, musketeers, equipped with cannon moving east. Yermak, of course, whatever the Stroganov's long-term aims, had not set out to conquer Siberia, but had executed a typical Cossack raid for spoils. In attacking Isker, he had probably not meant to hold it, but merely to sack it and withdraw before deep snow and ice prevented his escape upstream. But the way had been shown. His foray had dealt an irreversible blow to the Khanate, and it was never to be reassembled from its shattered parts. Within two decades of his death, the colorless hordes, as the natives called the Russians, would have much of western Siberia in their grasp. An armistice with Poland and Sweden in the west allowed the Russians to plot an organized reconquest, and with river highways facilitating their advance, Isker was immediately retaken and destroyed. Tiumen was founded in 1586 to consolidate Russia's position on the Tura River, and after the founding of Tobolsk at the confluence of the Tobil and Irtish rivers in 1587, about 12 miles northwest of where Isker once stood, no tribe could doubt that the Russians were there to stay. Unquote. And so, despite the near-total defeat of Yermak's original expeditionary force, the road is now open to the east. Settlers begin moving in, both Cossacks who want to exact tribute from local tribes and ordinary people who want to build a better life. Down-and-out noblemen come to Siberia to make a name for themselves, while savvy businessmen establish fur trading operations. But the pace of settlement is lackadaisical. See, while Ivan would probably have acted more decisively, the kingdom is now in the rule of his weak and possibly mentally disabled son, Tsar Feodor I. How this comes to happen is something of a story in and of itself. See, Ivan had an older son who would have become Ivan V upon his death. Young Ivan was a skilled military commander and able politician, but the older Ivan objects to a revealing outfit the younger Ivan's pregnant wife is wearing, and he beats her so badly that she miscarries. Young Ivan goes off on a tirade against his father, and the argument devolves into an argument over politics and military strategy. At one point, Ivan the Terrible takes his royal scepter and starts beating his son, and he beats the young Ivan so badly that he dies a few days later. So when Ivan the Terrible dies of a stroke in 1584, the throne passes to his second son, Feodor, who seems to have no interest or capability to rule. Most of the decisions of state are actually made by his prime minister, Boris Godunov, who is Feodor's brother-in-law and had been a trusted advisor of his father's. As a matter of fact, Godunov had been the only one present when Ivan the Terrible beat the young Ivan to death. And while Godunov claims he had tried to stop the Tsar, one wonders if he didn't encourage Ivan's rage. Because trouble seems to follow this guy. I should point out that I am only speculating here. I'm just... A dude on the internet speculating I have not seen evidence for this in any historical sources whatsoever. But if I'm writing the HBO screenplay for the fall of the Rurikid dynasty, I'd probably write this scene with 
Godunov subtly steering the conversation to the prince's faults, manipulating the czar, bringing up the younger Ivan's past failures, perhaps, trying to stoke Ivan the Terrible's explosive temper. Again, just speculation, but not only does Godunov take over most of the government from the incompetent Feodor, but his, he is alleged to be behind the assassination of Feodor's younger brother, Ivan's youngest son, Dmitri. It's never been proven, but unlike uh, the other thing we just discussed, this is not just speculation on my part. Rumors swirl around Moscow that the Prime Minister has ordered Dmitri's death and is paving the way for his own rise to power. Whether or not he is indeed the one who ordered the hit, so to say, the assassination of Dmitri is fortunate for Godunov. Because... When Feodor dies childless in 1598, Godunov becomes Tsar. Feodor's death and Godunov's ascension to the throne don't just mark a transition of power. They mark the end of the Rurikid dynasty, the line of rulers who descend from Rurik, the original Kievan Rus founder. It results in a real power vacuum, and it's the beginning of a period called the Time of Troubles a 15-year time span that will see no fewer than six Russian rulers. For all of the conspiracy theories about his rise to power, Godunov is legitimately elected by the Zemsky Sobor, and he rules for seven of those years, until 1605. So, why not just call the eight years between 1605 and 1613 the time of troubles, since that's the time when five of these short-term rulers lead. Well, unfortunately, the troubles start almost as soon as Godunov is crowned czar, and they're arguably caused by some of the policies he enacted while acting as regent for Feodor. And what's sad is that whatever you might say about his personal ambitions, he actually seems to have the well-being of the Russian people at heart. He just executes his ideas poorly, and circumstances don't work out in his favor. One of the most consequential things Godunov does is to establish a new Orthodox Church Patriarchate in Moscow in 1598. This further enhances the prestige of Russia. Moscow is now on par with the ancient cities of Constantinople, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch. No longer at the fringes of the church, Moscow now lies at its heart. The establishment of a new patriarchate also solidifies Russia's identity as a majority Eastern Orthodox nation. And given that the Patriarch of Constantinople now lives under Muslim Ottoman rule, it only makes sense for Russia to have her own truly independent patriarch. This also plays into an idea that you will still hear from Russian nationalists today. The idea of Russia as the heir to the Roman Empire and Moscow as the so-called Third Rome. It's an idea that Russian scholars start discussing around this time in history, and it's not as silly as you might think. From the Russian Orthodox perspective, Rome was lost to the Pope and Constantinople has fallen a century and a half before after agreeing to reunite with the Pope. Moscow is now the heir to Orthodox tradition. But even from a purely secular perspective, it also makes sense. The Roman Empire fell, and the Byzantine Empire carried the torch, and now, just as Constantinople has fallen, a new empire is rising in Eastern Europe. Rome Constantinople and Moscow are even all built on seven hills. But Godunov doesn't just accept a new patriarch and then rest on his laurels waiting for Moscow's glory to arrive. He takes action. He goes on a building spree, constructing churches and monasteries throughout Russia as well as on his private lands. 
Along with this, he builds a second wall for Moscow to protect the large market district that has grown up outside the Kremlin. He builds bridges over the Moskva River to support trade and even establishes almshouses in Moscow city proper. These are places where indigent people can go for a meal and a warm place to sleep. Outside the capital, he builds several fortresses along the frontier to augment the handful that have already been built. Most impressively of all, he constructs the Smolensk Kremlin on land recently occupied from the Polish in order to protect the western frontier. This fortress is modeled on the Moscow Kremlin, and it's one of the largest fortresses constructed anywhere in the world during this time period. The walls are 15 feet thick. They have a perimeter of four miles, and they stand between 40 and 60 feet tall, depending on the part of the wall. But all this construction is a massive undertaking. Russia doesn't have as much population or as many resources as other large European states. And this huge fortress at Smolensk threatens to break the bank. In fact, resources are so scarce that from 1596 to 1602... Boris Godunov bans any other masonry work anywhere in Russia under penalty of death. All stonemasons are conscripted and ordered to participate in the construction. Godunov knows that Russia's resources are limited, but he has to protect the country from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is directly to the west, and which has been fighting with the Russians for decades. To do this, he encourages expanded fur trading with the West. This is good for the economy, but increasing numbers of foreign visitors are upsetting to the church hierarchy. They see these mostly Catholic and Protestant visitors as a corrupting influence on the Russian population. Understand that these aren't just a few traders, either. Western mercenaries come to Russia to fight on her frontiers, Artisans and craftsmen, down on their luck in their native countries, turn east for new opportunities. And of course, diplomats are ever-present at court events. So, at the urging of the Orthodox Church leaders, Godunov founds a foreign quarter in Moscow. This is a designated neighborhood for foreigners to live in, and it's designed to cut them off so that they can't influence the local population with Western ideas. Understand that there's a real cultural clash here. Because while Western Europe in the late 16th and early 17th centuries seems very religious and pious to us modern folks, to someone in Russia at the time, the Renaissance seems abhorrently secular. We see this in art, where medieval art is almost exclusively religious and Renaissance art covers all kinds of themes. We can see it in literature. This is the era of Shakespeare, and his plays are strikingly modern, secular works, not something we'd expect from an obsessively religious, medieval-style culture. So, Looking at it through the eyes of these old-school Orthodox Church leaders, this sort of foreign influence might indeed be dangerous to the faith. The Church leaders also object to Godunov's plan to build a university in Moscow. Again, they view it as a wickedly secular enterprise, a way for good, pious Russians to become infected with foreign ways of thinking. So, as a compromise, Godunov instead sends 18 young Russian men to Western universities to learn and return to Russia with their knowledge. All of them find Western life more to their liking than the hardships of Mother Russia, and not a single one ever returns. This conflict over modernization even plays out in debates over the printing press. In 1453, the same year Constantinople fell, Johannes Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press, which enables people to print many copies of a work in record time, 
and it's right up there with the internet in terms of how it revolutionizes the way people communicate. By 1480, over a hundred years before the reign of Boris Godunov, there are more than 100 privately owned movable type printing presses in Western Europe, all of them churning out pamphlets, works of fiction, and other printed works, including a large number of religious works. And these books are also educational. They have maps, diagrams, mathematical dissertations. They discuss engineering, industrial techniques, mining, the kinds of things you need to transition from the medieval world to the modern. And let's not forget that there's a natural feedback loop. As the written word becomes more accessible, more people learn to read and the literacy rate increases and in turn you have a more educated population making even more scientific advances. Anyway, as I just said, by 1480, over a hundred years before Boris Godunov, there are over 100 of these presses operating in Western Europe. Well, the first movable type press to arrive in Russia doesn't get there until the 1560s. It's brought over at the request of Ivan the Terrible to function as part of his new state-run Moscow printing house. In 1564, it prints its first book, Acts and Epistles of the Apostles. Four years later, in 1568, a mob of scribes, fearing that their jobs will be made obsolete, burn down the Moscow printing house. After this, the Russian Orthodox Church will obtain a monopoly on printing presses in Russia, which will last until 1783. That's right. The Russian Empire does not have a single privately owned printing press until after the founding of the United States. This means that books are produced almost exclusively for religious purposes and they're in limited runs for distribution to folks in the church hierarchy. So as the rest of Europe, and indeed much of the world, is benefiting from the proliferation of the printed word, Russia is beginning to fall behind. So even by the standards of the late 18th century, Russia's population is poor and uneducated. And there's also a serious shortage of labor, which is exacerbated by peasants fleeing their lands and heading to the frontier. We're not just talking about skilled labor here. We're talking about basic agricultural labor, without which the country cannot feed itself. Now, if you will recall, the first people to settle Russia were basically Vikings. And Vikings, by medieval standards, were a fierce and independent people. But even as Western Europe has begun to modernize and peasants are gaining more rights, the common people in Russia are losing theirs. Throughout the 1500s, the Tsars have issued a series of decrees, slowly restricting the peasants' ability to move around and eventually turning them into serfs, forced to work the same land for generation after generation. Prior to Godunov, peasants have been allowed to leave their land, but only if they pay a fee to their landlord. The period for leaving your landlord is limited to a two-week period in late November. The law is designed to coincide with the end of the harvest, so peasants can move without disrupting their landlord's income. It's a chilly time of year to be moving house, but still... If the peasants can pay this fee, they are free to move, and many Russian peasants are willing to endure years of hardship and savings just to get off their land and out of their tenancy arrangements. Under the rule of Ivan the Terrible, with all the chaos of the Oprichniki, right, his personal cabal, who he allows to take over the land, many more of the peasants begin to emigrate to the frontier. 
and this causes that agricultural labor shortage we talked about. So, in the late 1560s, Ivan began temporarily suspending the right to leave your landlord, one year at a time. In 1597, Godunov issues a new decree, eliminating the right altogether. Russian peasants are now tied to the land and will remain so into the middle of the 1800s. Godunov is intentionally preventing migration to the frontier in order to maintain his agricultural base. To be fair, though, he is stuck in a trap. Without his agricultural base, his nobility won't be able to collect enough taxes from their tenants to run the army. With his agricultural base, Russian expansion is very much slowed down, and emigration to Siberia slows down. Unfortunately, so does emigration to recently conquered land in the south and modern-day Ukraine. This is excellent agricultural land where some of those fleeing peasants could do a lot of good work, but instead, due to Godunov's policies, the Russians aren't yet able to take full advantage. Even so, in 1600, it looks as if Godunov's policies are going to be successful in the long run. Russia is at peace, Russia no longer has to fear a maniacal czar, the population is booming, and while resources are still scarce, general wealth is on the upswing. But then a series of disasters strike, and all of them are worsened by Godunov's policies. The first of these disasters takes place all the way over in Peru, when the Huayna Putina volcano erupts in 1600. This eruption expels large quantities of dust and sulfuric acid into the atmosphere, obscuring the sun over much of the globe. Now, Russia's farmland is only marginal to begin with, so along with other northern latitude nations, her people suffer the worst. The famine begins in 1601. That year, an early frost hits Russia's central agricultural region, killing the rye and oat crop before most of it has been harvested. There's enough to eat, but prices soon double, and there's not enough grain to plant the next year's fields. By fall of 1602, the cost of grain has risen to eight times its pre-famine level. Boris Godunov empties the state granaries, selling the national reserves at half price and even giving free grain to the poorest Russians. But this year there's a drought, and the harvest, which would already have been meager because there wasn't enough grain to plant a full harvest, well, this harvest is reduced even further. So in 1603, despite the weather having finally returned to normal, there is nothing to eat. Millions starve. By some estimates, more than 2 million people or more than 30% of the Russian population. In Moscow alone, over 100,000 people are buried in mass graves. As you might imagine, this kind of desperation, this fight to survive, well, it brings about a breakdown in the social order. Crimes go unpunished as desperate people steal and kill to get whatever food they need to survive. There are even reports of cannibalism in the countryside. The time of troubles has now truly begun, and many of the Russian people blame none other than Boris Godunov for this mess. To some extent, this is understandable. It's like Harry Truman said, When you're the president, or in this case the Tsar, the buck stops here. Fairly or not, you are the person at the top of the totem pole. And when something goes wrong on a national level, people are going to blame you for it. But it goes a bit deeper than that. Many Russians blame Godunov for allowing too much Western influence into Russia 
defying the will of God and bringing a curse upon the land. Nobles begin backing pretenders to the throne, and one of the most popular causes is that of Dimitri. Yes, Ivan the Terrible's youngest son, Feodor's little brother Dimitri, who was assassinated, possibly at Godunov's order. See, some people don't believe he's actually dead. And other people who do believe he's dead are still willing to promote false Dimitris in order to back another claimant to the Russian throne. The first of these Dimitris has traveled to Moscow as early as 1600, presenting himself to the Patriarch of Moscow and impressing the Patriarch enough that Godunov tries to have him arrested, after which Dimitri flees back to Poland. According to Dimitri's story, his mother got wind of the assassination plot and secretly sent him to a monastery beforehand, after which he had snuck to Poland. According to Godunov's propaganda, Dmitri is nothing more than a runaway monk with delusions of grandeur. Most modern historians, on the other hand, believe that this Dmitri, who is known to history as false Dmitri I, was actually an illegitimate son of the Polish king. Things simmer for a bit. But after Boris Godunov dies unexpectedly of a stroke at the age of 53, his 16-year-old son, Feodor II, is proclaimed Tsar. But emissaries from the false Dmitri arrive in Moscow just a few weeks later, demanding that Dmitri be given the throne. Shortly thereafter, after reigning only for about six weeks, Feodor II is strangled to death in his bedroom no doubt by supporters of the false Dmitri, and the false Dmitri is declared Tsar on June 10, 1605. But no sooner does he take the throne that he begins to alienate the Russian people. He advocates pro-Polish policies, and on May 8, 1606, he marries a Polish Catholic noblewoman named Marina Mniesik, from all accounts... This is a marriage of love, which is a rare thing in this era, when most people, particularly the upper classes, married for purely practical reasons. But unfortunately for the young couple, Marina does not convert to Eastern Orthodoxy. Prominent Russian nobles take notice, and they give speeches accusing Dmitri of being a Catholic, or even, horror of horrors, a Lutheran. Less than two weeks later, on May 17, 1606, a combined mob of nobles and commoners, aided by Russian soldiers, attack the royal palace. Dmitri jumps from a balcony, breaks his leg, and manages to drag himself to a steam bath where he tries to hide, but a group of nobles find him and kill him on the spot. And so the reign of the first false Dmitri ends after less than a year. Next, the nobles elect a man named Vasily Shusky, who becomes Vasily IV. Vasily IV is a previous supporter of the false Dmitri, who had seen how the wind was blowing, switched sides, and helped lead the coup. Shusky makes a big show of disavowing Dmitri's policies, even going so far as having the false Dmitri cremated, packing his ashes into a cannon, and firing the cannon towards Poland. But Vasily IV also starts out his reign with a dumb move. Recognizing the threat that exists from within the army, remember it was some army troops who helped to overthrow Dmitri, uh, well, Vasily tries to disband the army. The soldiers riot, and they kill thousands of people in the course of the riot. Vasily IV is only in power because he's related to the Rurikid family, and the leading nobles can't agree on anyone better to replace him with. For most of his reign, he holds power only in the region around Moscow. 
Various noble factions go to war with each other, with Cossacks and other groups taking up arms for themselves. In February of 1609, the Swedish launch an intervention to help restore order, and they do this largely at the urging of Vasily IV's cousin, Prince Mikhail Skopinshuski. This briefly restores the peace, but the Swedes are at war with the Polish at the time, right? Those Polish who are rivals with the Russians. And this whole intervention is designed to bring Russia into the war on the Swedish side. In the fall of 1609, not willing to wait for a Russian attack, Polish King Sigismund III invades preemptively. He hopes to make Russia a puppet state ruled by his son Vladislav. Unable to resist at the moment, the Russians turn to negotiations. Vasily IV agrees to let Vladislav become Tsar and convinces the leading Russian nobles to agree. At least with a dynastic alliance with Poland, Russia won't have to worry about their western border. They actually welcome Polish troops into Moscow. But once inside, King Sigismund decides that he's not going to let his son become Tsar. He's going to become Tsar himself and then absorb Russia into Poland. This is far from a done deal. See, the seven boyars, a group of powerful nobles, have already deposed Vasily IV and they are now leading a resistance. The Polish invasion has done what Vasily IV could not. It has united the Russian people in a common cause. At this time, a wealthy meat trader named Kuzma Minin is living in the city of Nizhny Novgorod to the east of Moscow. After Moscow's fall to the Polish, he leads a group of wealthy merchants in raising enough money to pay for an army. This army, known as the Second Volunteer Army, forms the bulk of forces the Russians will be able to deploy. Incidentally, the massive fortress Boris Godunov built at Smolensk, remember that? Well, that fortress and its 5,000 defenders will tie up an entire Polish army for more than 20 months during this war. The war goes on for nearly three years, but in 1612, a large portion of the Polish army revolts due to unpaid wages. In November of that year, after a siege of 19 months, the Polish garrison at the Moscow Kremlin surrenders, and Moscow is once again firmly in Russian hands. The rest of the Polish army retreats beyond the frontier, although a formal peace treaty will not be signed until 1618, six years later. With Moscow retaken, the seven boyars have a new task— to find a new Tsar. So they convene the Zemsky Sobor, the Russian parliament, to decide the issue. The delegates debate for weeks, but on February 21, 1613, they unanimously vote to elect a 16-year-old young man named Mikhail Romanov. He wins the throne in part because he is unthreatening. His grandfather had been a friend of Ivan the Terrible, and Boris Godunov had exiled the baby Mikhail and his mother to a monastery, where he had been living his whole life far removed from politics. As a matter of fact, it takes almost a month for the Zemsky Sobor's messengers to travel to the monastery and locate him. But point being, having lived in a monastery his whole life, he is not tied up with any of the particular factions amongst the Russian nobility. So, while he's not a friend to any of them in particular, none of them sees him as an enemy either. Now, there are dubious claims that Mikhail can trace his ancestry back to Russia's first founders, but those claims are probably just inventions to boost his legitimacy. That said... 
Mikhail does have the honor of founding Russia's last ruling dynasty, the Romanov dynasty, which will rule for the next 304 years until 1917. Coming out of the time of troubles, the Russian people are willing to accept a stronger leader. After all, a single, all-powerful Tsar brings peace and tranquility. A weak Tsar and powerful nobles brings chaos and civil war. Or at least that's what the average Russian of the time would tell you. And the early Romanovs will have long reigns during which to centralize their power. Mikhail will rule for 32 years until 1645, and his son Alexei will reign for another 31 years until 1676. So after this series of weak rulers during the 15 years of the Time of Troubles, the Russians will now have 63 years under the rule of two stronger rulers. And with internal peace and stability, the new Romanov dynasty will be able to look outwards once again. To the west, they seek the trade and culture of Europe. But to the east, they seek the riches of Siberia and beyond. And while I had intended to tell the full story of Russia's Siberian conquest in one episode, it's become apparent that that's not possible. At least not unless you want to wait another two weeks for a mammoth four-hour episode. Instead, we'll tell the rest of the story in part two of... Go east, young man. Go east. Hi, guys. If you enjoy Dan's fascinating deep dives into historical events, I'd encourage you to check out my podcast, Anthology of Heroes. My name's Elliot Gates, and in each episode, I walk through the life of a hero from a different era of time. Through knife-edge victories, defiant last stands, and epic final speeches, you'll learn about the lives of some of the most fascinating individuals to ever walk the face of the earth. Like Tekon Oman, a Mayan prince who held the line against Spanish conquistadors in a tale that's still famous in Guatemala today. While over on the tiny Mediterranean island of Malta, a 72-year-old Grand Master Vallette held the line with 600 knights against 40,000 Ottoman invaders in what's remembered as the greatest siege of all time. Or up in Wales, Owen Glendore threw off the shackles of English oppression, rose up against the tyrannical king and led the Welsh in the greatest rebellion in the country's history. All these stories and so many more are available right now on the Anthology of Heroes podcast, available on all podcasting platforms as well as Instagram. Hope to see you there. Back to you, Dan. Guess who? It's me again, Dan. And I'm here just to tell you about a few things we're doing to expand the channel here at Relevant History. The first thing that we're doing is a series called Dan's War College. This is a series of exclusive videos from yours truly detailing various military battles and tactics in history and breaking down how they worked in a little more detail than we do here on the main show. If you're interested in that, it is a Patreon exclusive. The link for the Relevant History Patreon is in the description. And the monthly fee for the subscription is $5. By the way, with that, you also get access to a private Discord chat room with yours truly. And yes, I take requests for those Patreon videos. Of course, not everybody is able to or wants to contribute financially, and that's just fine. I'm glad you're listening. If you enjoy the show, why not share it with a friend? Help grow the audience and share something you love with somebody who might enjoy it. Also, it never hurts to leave a review. People are more likely to listen if they see a show with a bunch of reviews, particularly good ones, but eh, if you hated the show, go ahead and leave a review saying that, too. Tell me why you didn't like it. Alternatively, you could just reach out to me on Twitter at Dan Toller Podcast or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Dan Toller Podcast. That's Dan T-O-L-E-R Podcast. 
You can also reach me at dantollerpodcast at gmail.com if you think that I've made an error in one of the episodes or you just wanted to say hello. Finally, to find all of my episodes with links to all the various subscription services and podcast feeds as well as my blog, which I have not updated in ages, but uh, you never know. You can find all of that at dantollerpodcast.com. That's dan, T-O-L-E-R, podcast.com. Thanks for listening.